Um, it'll say viewers. It'll say viewers at the bottom corner, so you can see like it'll say. There's no one watching right now, but at two o'clock it'll be. Yeah. Looks like I have sound, which is good. I see the green light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you got here. Then I can leave the mic, you know, ahead of time. I'll just leave it on. Hello. 
Um, I want to tell you a few things about the defense in general and Ed's defense in particular and the process, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ed. Um, as you know, the defense for the dissertation as an academic exercise is a long standing academic tradition, and it is the culmination of considerable, intense, focused, dedicated work which we as faculty and advisors and colleagues see as emergent and collaborative. We really believe that here. Secondly, we are a leadership program. And uh, as my colleagues will say and also agree with, although not every dissertation has had leadership in it, they are all about leadership. We urge our students to pursue research for problems of practice that affect change in education with the emphasis that leadership affects that change. So here is a dissertation today that really is a model of leadership, and we are very, very proud to hear the result. About Ed's defense in particular, there are two features today that are unique to this dissertation. Uh, first is, of course, that part of this presentation will be shared with us uh, using technology, but no irony there since this subject is technology and student care practice. Uh, but it's not something we typically see in our dissertation defenses. And given the very nature of his study, his expertise, and his standing in this field, it was a natural fit. The second thing that we're doing today, which we have not done before, and we're hoping that this goes smoothly, is that this is being live streamed. So, uh, and again, the irony is not lost on us that more people are out there than you are here. And so we are very excited about that and are welcoming all the people who are joining us virtually as well. And again, uh, it's very important to us as a leadership program that we are modeling the tools that our students and colleagues use in their own settings. And we are uh, trying to integrate those all the time in our own classes as you do where you work and where you teach. Uh, finally, for the process today, for those of you who are familiar with this drill, uh, Ed will speak about his topic, his interest in the topic, his methods and his findings, recommendations for about 30 minutes. Uh, I will then open it up to questions for the committee. Uh, our, uh, Dr. Peters, our third committee member who is in Hartford, is actually live streaming as well because we couldn't get to Skype to work. Um, and Dr. Warner, and they are going to ask questions, and then I'm going to open it up to other faculty, uh, Dr. Ward, and uh, whoever else might join us in the process. And then it will go to the members of the audience if we have time. I'll ask you then to step outside while the committee deliberates, and then I'll come out and share the results with Ed. And we will have completed his dissertation. So I'm going to turn this over to Ed. Thank you. Dr. Phillips, Dr. Peters, <laughs> Dr. Warner. <laughs> Distinguished members of the Johnson & Wales University Educational Leadership Doctoral Faculty, Staff, and JWU community. Fellow doctoral students and candidates, and colleagues from the Academy, both in person and online watching today. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for being here with me, particularly in the weather that we're having here in the Northeast. I am delighted to be with all of you today to share my dissertation research findings um, and recommendations for the educational field. My interest in the topic of digital technology has been a consistent piece of my professional identity since 1997. Through every position that I've held throughout the academy, technology has been the connecting fiber that has propelled me into leadership roles. Back when I was a new professional, I knew that technology had the potential to evolve and change the student affairs profession and in ways that we may not even know until now. I know that currently, as constituted in the academy, Technology plays a major role in the things that we do, both in the classroom and beyond. And as a leader in higher education, it was important to me to explore what those possibilities were and provide those findings for colleagues and, and those who work with students to make sure that we are propelling the academy forward in a meaningful way. And while my professional reputation focuses on technology acumen, my dissertation process emphasized on technology's evolving role in student affairs leadership. The purpose of my study was to analyze how student affairs administrators utilize digital technology over the past 10 years, from 2005 to 2015. Digital technology in higher education exponentially grew over the past 10 years, in part to the rapid evolution of the internet, social networking services, and mobile smartphones. 
During this time frame, it should also be noted that the academy evolved as well, given the amount um, of differences in how to achieve a higher education degree, as well as internal and external forces that have forced the academy to rethink how they deliver a higher education. When you add in the fact that student affairs administrators have been at the forefront of supporting students and helping students overcome many different challenges that they have now brought to our campuses, it's no wonder that digital technology remains to be a current and important topic. Over the last 10 years, however, digital technology research in higher education has primarily focused on classroom applications in the pedagogy and in the way that students learn in the classroom. It's important to note that emerging scholarship over the last five years, particularly from Dr. Ray Luko, um, who works at Iowa State University, who, studied, who has studied uh, social technologies and the impact on higher education, Dana, Dr. Dana Boyd at MIT, who have worked in the areas of youth and network publics, as well as Dr. Sherry Turkle from MIT, who looks at psycho, the psychoanalysis of human technology interaction. And you add into that also recent doctoral dissertations focused on digital technology related research from scholars such as Kevin Guidry, Laura Pasquini, Josie Alquist, and Adam Gismondi highlight the growing landscape of digital technology research throughout higher education in regards to students. Yet, there still remain a gap with how student affairs administrators specifically use digital technology in their practice. The problem that I stated in my dissertation was that I believe the student affairs, the profession is at, a, is at a crossroads. Given the fact that technology has a profound impact or may have a, a profound impact in our students and our own professional development, where will student affairs go as we look to the future, thinking about how the field as well as the academy continues to evolve? Leaders have an important choice to make on how technology is used intentionally to connect students, staff, and faculty on the lifelong journey of growth and exploration that student affairs professionals tout that their purpose are. My initial research questions were as follows. Research question one, how has digital technology changed student affairs administrative practice from 2005 to 2015? And three sub-questions came from that. One, since 2005, how have student affairs administrators utilized digital technology in their day-to-day -day work? 1B was how the two primary uh, student affairs associations, NASPA and ACPA, provided for formal digital technology educational opportunities for student affairs professionals. And what aspects of digital technology, question 1C, what aspects have student affairs professionals used the most? Research question two focused on how can digital technology affect student affairs practice in the future? And due to the research findings from my dissertation study, a third research question was, was added. And that was, how did student affairs administrators manage organizational change process as digital technology evolved and changed? In terms of my methodology, I used a qualitative historical interpretive method. Um, in educational research, Dahlgall and Moore described it as, quote, a process of systematically searching for data to answer questions about a phenomenon from the past to gain a better understanding of the foundations of present institutions, practices, trends, and beliefs. In addition, Gall et al. noted, quote, it is possible through careful analysis and multiple sources of evidence to discover what actually happened during a given time period with respect to the phenomenon being investigated. As a historical researcher, um, most, most, most historians will look at two types of data sources primary and secondary. Historical research in primary, a primary source is a document or a physical object um, that was written or created during the time that that was being studied. So in my case, it was the past 10 years. These sources were present during an experience or time period that offered an inside view to the particular phenomenon being studied. Secondary sources function and could be added as a way to interpret primary sources. But for the purposes of my study, I focused primarily on three primary sources. The first was I, I looked at five elite interviews. And elite interviews were defined by Dexter in 2006 by 
So the fact that they were um, interviews that provide a special uh, piece of information or perspective that would not normally be um, available to the researcher. These folks that I interviewed as part of my research study were folks who have been early adopters of technology who started back in 2005 and were some of the leaders, some of the folks who were considered by many as educators and pioneers in educational technology and student affairs. The elite interviews provided a political perspective that I wouldn't have had access to otherwise. The second data source I looked at was 11 key informant interviews. And the key informant interviews were student affairs professionals who began their professional career in 2005 and have worked for the last 10 years, who have experienced technology and really didn't know any different. They didn't have a different perspective other than that technology was available to them and they were using. Gilchrist and Williams posited that key informant interviews were critical to understanding the culture of the phenomenon. And I know I gained greater perspective of their professional use by interviewing them and working with them. The third uh, source of data that I used were documents, a document analysis, 206 pieces of documents that some, some historians may look at also as not just a primary source, but also an archival, an archival source. So I looked at 206 pieces of doc document, documentary evidence from conference presentations to books, things that were related directly to digital technology that the associations were using to teach student affairs professionals about the topic. I collected, data over a, I collected this data over a six week period where I first interviewed the elite interviewees, then I interviewed the key informant of the depth interviewees, and then I analyzed the documents. So I did that sequentially. Um, in order to gain access to, the, to these folks, I worked with the associations, and I sent emails out through the association's listservs, as well as direct emails uh, from the association themselves. Um, these interviews were conducted using Google uh, on-air Hangouts, and they were recorded for data analysis purposes. Then they were sent to rev.com for transcription, and I used those in my data analysis, which I'll discuss next. Um, the data analysis process uh, for my study was an, anal was an analyst constructed topology that was employed to inductively, inductively develop what Patton described as, quote, a classification system constructed by the researcher to divide some aspect of the world to distinct um, types. I used thematic analysis. Um, uh, with the interview data, with the key and elite interview data, um, and went through an observation, understanding, and then the coding process. Video and audio transcriptions were, were created um, through that. And then after that, I did content analysis of all the documents. And I used um, a four-step process, which is important to know. The first process in the content analysis was um, conceptual analysis. So I wanted to know from each document what technology concepts were present in each document. Second, I looked at it procedurally. How was it presented or how was it organized? I wanted to know that piece because it was important in terms of looking at historically how that played out. The relation that ended a relational analysis, so I wanted to compare the concepts related to digital technology um, to what student affairs administrators were actually reported that they were doing through the interview process. And then an emotional analysis. I wanted to know sentimentally how is it being, how are these documents worded? How are they presented? You know, was there an inherent bias in each of the documents? So I wanted to make sure I knew that as well. And finally, I ensured trustworthiness, who um, Lincoln and Buba describes as important to qualitative research. And I established credibility first through the triangulation of those three data sources. I established transferability by making sure through thick description that I fully outlined and described the data collection process and procedures. Through dependability, I uh, created an external audit um, by utilizing a faculty colleague from another uh, faculty member colleague uh, from the School of the Northeast who looked at chapters three and four specifically to make sure that that was there. And then confirmability by making sure I had a reflexivity journal of all of the what was happening throughout the data collection process. So, given that, I want to share with you what I So that, so now that I, so this is the, this is for me is really exciting. So. In my in, so I did in case and cross case analysis of my data sets. So in other words, I looked at the key informant interviews first, then I went to the elite, and then I went to the document. And then I did a cross cross case analysis where I did a, a, a 
a cumulative synthesis of all of the data combined together. What, what was that looking like? And so to show you that, I found that digital technology by student affairs administrators were used primarily three ways. And this came out the same way in both the key and OE interviews. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, student affairs administrators utilize digital technology to build greater capacity throughout their work. The second is that they used it to augment existing engagement efforts that they were already doing on their campuses and beyond. And then the third is that they catalyze change both on and off campus utilizing digital technology. And you can see from the, the slide I have here in your handout that each of the, each of the groups, it, the, the themes manifest itself differently. So the elite interviewees saw each of these a little bit different. In terms of building capacity, the elite interviewees saw it as ways to expand current roles and um, looking at how do you how do we reach people beyond students beyond the 18 to 24 residential population. Whereas the whereas the folks on the um, the key informant side of depth interviews, they saw building capacity as they wanted new create, positions created because it was that important to move us forward. And the other side of it was they would start the those folks were using data from dashboards from digital data uh, from digital tools that they were using to inform their practice. When you look at augmenting engagement, the elite interviewees saw it as a way to figure out how do we connect with online communities, how do we look at those online students and figure out a way for student affairs to have a role in that. And then they looked at and acknowledged that there were various learning styles at play from our students that we need to start addressing the whole notion of meeting students where their app came up a lot, and that related to their learning styles. On the other side, when you look at augmented engagement, those folks looked at it as expanding the breadth and depth of who we were engaging with. In other words, it wasn't just students anymore. It was each other, it was faculty, it was staff. And then the, the use of media was very evident in the depth interviews. They were citing many different ways they were using it, and they had seen colleagues use it over the last 10 years. And finally, in terms of the, the um, catalyzing change piece, the elite interviewees saw a lot of the, talked about, a lot about the resistance, the fact that there was a lot of resistance to the change piece of this that inherently would come with using digital technology tools. In addition, they were trying to show others through education and example that there was usefulness related and that change could only happen is if you demonstrated usefulness to other administrators and faculty that they wouldn't use it otherwise. When you mirror the other side of the change piece, the depth interviewees looked at it as, look, I'm gonna experiment with these tools and I'm gonna show you through my experimentation, through trial and error, that this is actually gonna make a difference in our, in our um, student engagement and other efforts. And in addition, they saw the, the change in the process as leading by example. They wanted to be the one on the forefront <clears throat> to, to show people that there was it was, it was um, useful <clears throat> and meaningful. When you look at the cross case analysis of of this, it manifests itself um, in this historic timeline. So if you think of a historical study, you probably in your in your mind think of some sort of timeline that would take place. This is an overview of the document analysis that created this historic timeline. And I will go through each of these in a second, but you should, you should note that this also takes into account the number of documents that were available to, to me at the time of research. And you can see that from 2005, there were only two documents throughout both associations, all the way to 51 in 2015, that there has been this growth that's taken place. In the first four years of the study, you can see that there was a disdain in 2005 around the general attitude was, you know, that um, it's probably a fad, it's going to go away, we're not going to really use this long term. And there wasn't a lot of folks who were in really buying into the idea of utilizing te technology in a more intentional way. As you go through 2006 and 2007, there began to be this personal exploration. People were using technology for themselves and then finding concurrent applications for how they were doing it and how they could do it in their work. And then in 2008, the faculty research started to emerge <clears throat> to demonstrate how it could be used <clears throat> excuse me, in a classroom setting. And so that research was available and started being um, connected to how student affairs practitioners might be able to use it. 
<clears throat> the attitudes from the Keen and Leap informant interviews highlighted a lot of this. These are just some of the quotes. These are two quotes from one elite and one depth interview. <clears throat> there was a one elite interview, he said there was a lot of exploration and a lot of disdain. Um, <clears throat> and then the experimentation was a common theme in those first four years for the for the depth interviews for the key for the key one. Moving on to 2009 and 2012, you can see that experimentation started to take place in 2009. The expansion of not only digital technology, but digital communication, including social networks, started to really take shape. They began to build these communities, and the growth opportunities for technology was, was stated in the documents um, and through the interviews. And then the acceptance piece of 2012. There was this, OK, maybe there is something to this. Maybe we'll start utilizing it a little more intentionally. Even though faculty, just four years ago, were already doing it, there was this curve of people not wanting to try it for fear of, I mean, there was, this, there was a fear element piece, but when we look at what folks talked about, there was this personal versus professional congruence challenges that still remain today for many of our colleagues and student affairs, as well as the fact that the, the, um, the key informants talked about how they noticed colleagues' job descriptions changing to add technology, that new positions were in fact being created at larger institutions that could afford to do this piece. Um, but the clear thing, the clear sentiment in this time period was the fact that there wasn't enough education, that the expectations were there for us to begin to start using it more intentionally, but no one was really formally teaching it, especially in the graduate prep programs of student affairs. When you look at most recent history, you can see that um, there was an increased sophistication throughout both associations and the documents. Um, both sets of interviewees talked about this, that it, it resonated. There was one example that talked about how the use of Twitter at conferences was what really got people in student affairs engaged on using a tool such as Twitter to for professional development. That's where the innovation started coming in in 2014 and 15. And the idea that people began to create more bandwidth to learn and utilize this because there was more evidence that, that it actually does work and that it could have a place more. So this is the timeline. And really, the thing that stood out for me was in this timeline, it's shifted to now it's OK to connect with students. And it's almost expected that people are connecting with students online. Um, and while our, the depth folks said, while our use has been expanded, our sophistication has not, uh, even though SSAOs are more open to the idea of using technology. And the, and the comment, the sly comment about um, still teaching Perry in our graduate programs, I thought was very interesting to me. Um, so from this, I'm um, through all this. I'm proud to present um, this uh, model. And my historical research utilized a, futuro a futurology lens to inform future student affairs practice. And based on my analysis, I'm proud to present this model. It's a technology implementation model for education, <clears throat> and the model itself highlights many of the things that were stated throughout the interview process and through the documents. And that if the profession of student affairs are to move forward to implement technology more um, intuitively as well as purposefully, that this model may be helpful to those looking to do so. <clears throat> the first, um, <clears throat> if we were looking at it <clears throat> cyclically, excuse me, first step is to acknowledge technology biases. And many folks, from folks who <clears throat> utilize this technology on a daily basis, but the bias because they like it, <clears throat> to those who maybe consider this Luddites who don't want to use it, <clears throat> cited that that was a major um, obstacle, a roadblock to actually moving forward. <clears throat> In that we can't even begin to look at technology if we can't acknowledge our biases about the technology at the, at the first step. And so that's the first step of, of, step of, of the model. The next step would be to explore personally and then experiment professionally with those tools, much like the, the key informant interviewees stated that was successful for them. And that the idea is that that experience would generate confidence, and that confidence would then generate the opportunity to at least try it out. The next piece would be to share evidence and ideas. And we know this to be true through student affairs practice, that sharing data and sharing the evidence with colleagues are one way to get people to start thinking about and moving people towards that, um, that acceptance piece. 
And then the last two cycle pieces are building innovative partnerships and creating communities of practice. We also know this on our campuses where we look to each other, specifically in student affairs divisions, to you know, either to teach one another or to demonstrate through partnerships with IT, or partnerships with folks in our institutional communication area, how can we do this together so that it's not this siloed activity yet, it's something that we do together and purposefully. I added the three areas of building capacity, augmenting engagement, and catalyzing change because it's an important piece if someone were to come into the model and decide, okay, I've gotten through the first three points, you know, I want to look at sharing evidence. Well, does your evidence relate to one of the three pieces? Is it augmenting engagement? Are you building capacity? Or are you changing yourself, professionally, personally, the field, your division? Then you have, then yes, absolutely share it. So that is why those three pieces are added in the center because I think critically people would want to know, well, where should I be focused in on? And those three areas will be, will be there. <clears throat> So implementation efforts of this model will vary due to campus size and scope. However, I do have a few recommendations for specific audiences. For student affairs associations who may be listening right now, I would recommend catalyzing change by creating a cross-association, student affairs related um, graduate preparatory program task force, who is gonna, we're gonna explore how to meaningfully utilize and teach digital technology throughout the educational processes, from grad programs all the way through current professional development programs. I think it's time that we acknowledge that we're deficient in this area and that we need to add a formalized process to teach the students, as well as professionals, how to use these more meaningfully. For senior student affairs officers who may be listening, I would expand technology, digital technology training to include conversations around psychosocial impacts of digital technology in our work and lives. I think it's important not just to teach them about the tools, but also to teach them about how it affects us and how we need to be role models in order to meet, to, or to help our professional staff to be okay and comfortable with using these tools. That is a piece that is missing and something we, we need to do. And finally, for student affairs administrators, I would challenge my colleagues to start utilizing the following four questions as you think about your programs and services. First, how do we deliver this program and service in a digital format? And what kind of data could we gain by doing so? Second, how do we utilize digital communication platforms to share our division's learning outcomes more strategically? Third, how do we connect the data we collect to our university's central student information system so that more folks understand and know what we do as a profession? And finally, how do we reallocate budgetary resources to support our departmental use of digital technology to inspire innovative practice within our own ranks. Recommendations for future scholars and future study regarding um, this research and future. Some examples include that future doctoral students or educational researchers could use the data that I've already collected from the elite and key interviewees and do focus groups with each of them and do, for example, a phenomenological study and look at how did they live their experiences um, throughout the last 10 years and figure out a little bit more deeper about how and why they did the things they did. In addition, I may add senior student affairs officers as a focus group as well, because that's a group that we need to look at also. Professional associations could also further their general understanding of administrative technology by uh, taking information technology data from associations like EDUCOS um, and applying it to student affairs administrators in practice. A sequential explanatory mixed method study might broaden the understanding of the how and why administrators use specific technologies. And one final example is that a postdoc student might conduct a case study with student affairs divisions that has intentionally implemented digital technology throughout their divisional practice and find out if it's made a difference and find out if things have actually changed and to the extent why or to the extent why not. In closing, uh, the results of the study may assist student affairs and higher education leaders seeking to purposefully and strategically integrate digital technology into their practice. The technology implementation model for education provides a preliminary blueprint for leaders, administrators, and educators alike to create meaningful action relative to their institutional size and scope. Over the next 10 years, I believe student affairs administrators and leaders should explore new ways to digitize their various programs and services in order to 
reach, reach a wider audience of students, faculty, and staff. And given digital technology's ubiquity throughout the academy, student affairs leaders can now confidently know that they have a model and a study that they can look at specifically around digital technology use by student affairs administrators. In conclusion, I would add that um, digital technology research as well as its use across the academy in student affairs is ongoing and ever-changing and complex, and I recognize that. And while residential, um, the residential experience evolves in the academy throughout our campuses, university leaders must find ways to continue to intentionally support commuter students, hybrid and online students, utilizing the very digital technology we ask them to use today. And given the complexity, the size and type of each institution must be, must be taken into account when doing any meaningful implementation. I believe that student affairs administrators have the ability and now the tools to make this change. And I hope that they will utilize the findings from my study to move that, move that change forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was fabulous. And I to say goodbye to our friends all over the world. Thanks, everybody.